Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Jennifer and Lance. This series of Crimes of the Occult is very exciting. Jen, can you tell us a little bit about what our listeners are about to hear? Yes, just in time for the Halloween spooky season. Each story was chosen because a crime occurred, yes, but each has an element that is unexplainable, occult, or just plain scary. Each one of us takes one of these stories, we narrate it, and we present it to you all for your listening pleasure. Think of them as bedtime stories to give you nightmares. And this is Jen bringing you the story of the Maxim Gun. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. The Maxim Gun. In 1885, William Cantalo finished the secret weapon he had been building in the tunnels below his laboratory in Southampton, England. Within three months, both William and his weapon had vanished. Before World War II, you could walk from one end of Southampton to the other, entirely underground, through its web-like system of tunnels. In the Middle Ages, residents of Southampton were required to pay a wine tax to the monarchy. They used these vaults and tunnels to store wine, imported from France, to hide them. During the war, however, these tunnels provided shelter from air raids, as the southern English port city was a strategic target for Luftwaffe bombers, due to the many factories that were busy making Spitfire planes. And in a series of 57 blitzes, the tunnel system and vaults were mostly destroyed. Our story, however, takes place a century before, at the height of Victorian England. The 19th century was at odds with itself. Industry became mechanized, and many from remote farming regions moved to larger cities to work in factories. This was the age of the Industrial Revolution, and it became quite lucrative to invent and patent crazy mechanical contraptions and operate factories for mass production. Southampton was one such industrial city. Perhaps in reaction to this new way of life, the spiritualist movement took hold, where the height of society intrigue was to hold seances to commune with the dead. The Theosophical Society, a group of intellectual occultists, embraced a more worldly view of esotericism and science. William Cantelo was not a spiritualist. In fact, he kind of despised that woo-woo stuff. Instead, he embraced this industrial era and capitalized. So it's kind of ironic that William's legacy is exceedingly bizarre, unbelievable, and possibly a cult. Not only was William Cantelow a successful manufacturer and mechanical engineer, but he was also an accomplished musician and served as bandmaster for the Second Hampshire. William owned many properties throughout Southampton as well. Some of his assets included a shop at French Street opposite the Theatre Royal and a factory yard in Northam. He also owned the Old Tower Inn, a former medieval garrison that operated as a tavern and family home for his wife and two sons. From this tower at the bottom of Bargate Street, some said you could access the tunnels beneath and walk as far as High Street, which is about a half mile underground. Beneath the old tower inn, William set up a secret laboratory in which to invent and perfect a classified mechanical weapon. William worked on his weapon behind a tightly bolted cellar door that led down to his vaults. There's a rich history of secrecy around weapons, from the Manhattan Project to build the atom bomb, to Nikola Tesla, an ingenious inventor whose secret work on what he called the death ray was never seen by the public. And upon Tesla's death in a New York hotel, the U.S. government 
seized all of his blueprints in 1943, at the height of World War II. Perhaps William was a kind of precursor to all this. As William's sons grew of age, they naturally became involved in their father's business endeavors. They managed the shop, yard, and tavern. Yet it was their father's shadow industry that drew their real fascination. On Saturdays, the young men and their mother would often hear loud bangs from the bowels of the tower. After many questions and much prodding, William finally allowed his sons to see what he'd been building for months on end. The Cantalo sons must have reverently stood aside as William painstakingly unlocked the chains and the bolts on the cellar door. How deep and dark that winding stairwell must have seemed. Like in Frankenstein, William's sons descended into a secret laboratory to discover what monster their father had created in the dreamy glow of a newly invented incandescent light bulb they saw the weapon a polished wooden box stood upon a tripod a trigger to its back and a carbon steel barrel to its front clearly this was a dramatic new design on something the british military would surely covet the so-called machine gun The machine guns of the 1800s were extremely problematic. The infamous Gatling gun had imprecisely machined chambers and bolts that didn't always align, making accuracy a kind of horseshoe and hand grenade game. The 12 barrel Nordenfeldt gun fired too slowly. And the Gardner gun, adopted by the UK, operated by feeding bullets from a hopper into a chamber, which often got stuck. William's Cantalo Capstan, as he called the new machine gun, outclassed them all in accuracy, velocity, and mechanical operation. Fond of maxims, and often carrying around a book of these generalized truths, William affectionately referred to the weapon as, quote, my maxim gun. In 1885, William announced that his maxim gun was finally finished and ready to be marketed to the British military. But after all of his hard work, William decided that he was going to go on holiday. Apparently one to be paranoid enough that someone else would steal his prototype or glimpse the gun and file a patent before he could, William bade his sons to pack up the Maxim gun to take with him. It was a small enough contraption that it could easily be broken down and made mobile. And bidding his family a quick farewell, William set off for a holiday on the continent. Frequently traveling to Europe for business, it was not unusual for William to be gone for weeks at a time, yet three months passed of unreturned letters and no sight of him. William and his machine gun had vanished. The Cantalo sons, fearing for their father's life, made inquiries with Scotland Yard and officially reported him missing. They found out that William had traveled through a few countries in Europe and had transferred a large sum of money. To what account, we'll never know. Investigators traced William's journey all the way to the United States, but there, the trail went cold. William's family was at a loss. The promise of riches from William's new patent disintegrated as their heart sickness grew over their father's absence. Though mail was received more slowly in those days, letters shipped daily back and forth across the English Channel. Why would he have broken contact with his family? Why didn't he tell them he had plans to sail to America? And if he needed money, why was there no record of him trying to at least patent his gun? let alone trying to sell his designs to the highest military bidder. The months dragged on, and nothing was ever heard of William Cantalo again, until early one morning that same year of 1885, the Cantalo sons were reading the newspaper over breakfast when they flipped to a startling article. Staring up at them from page two was their father's picture and a headline on the new invention of a rapid-firing machine gun. And yet, hardly believing their eyes, 
The name beneath their father's picture did not read William Candelo, but another name, Hiram Maxim. The article continued, Hiram Maxim was a legendary inventor from America. He had come to England in 1881 as the organizational coordinator of the United States Electric Lighting Company at its London offices. In London, Hiram perfected what he called the Maxim gun. William's sons read this and decided that their father had resurfaced under a new name. And it might be an easy stretch of the imagination to think that William Cantelo had gone underground, distancing himself from his family and former life for whatever reason. Perhaps debtors were after William and the only way out for him was to fake his own disappearance? Perhaps William just wanted to start afresh. This is still a prevailing theory. However, this theory cannot account for the full history of Hiram Maxim's life in America before he emigrated to England. Sir Hiram Stevens Maxim was born in Sangerville, Maine on February 5th, 1840. When he was 14, Hiram became a carriage maker's apprentice in America, and by the end of his career, could boast 271 patents to his name. He married a woman called Jane in 1867, and allegedly also married another woman, Helen, in 1878, committing bigamy and having a child by her. Then he married a third wife, Sarah, in Boston, before sailing with her to England in the early 1880s. All these women attest to Hiram's presence in the United States during the years that William ran his businesses in England. Then, there's Hiram's storied career as an inventor. Hiram's patents include hair curlers, mouse traps, steam pumps, amusement park rides, and menthol inhalers. Interestingly, Hiram laid claim to the invention of the incandescent bulb and filed many patent disputes with the Edison Company. When Hiram arrived in Europe, he worked for the U.S. Electric Company. In 1882, while in Vienna, Hiram says he met an American whom he had known in the States. This American said to him, quote, Hang your chemistry and electricity. If you want to make a pile of money, invent something that will enable these Europeans to cut each other's throats with greater facility. When he was a boy, Hiram remembered that he shot his father's rifle and had been knocked over by the rifle's recoil. That inspired him to use the force of recoil to automate the reloading and firing of a gun. So, between 1883 and 1885, Hiram settled in Lord Thurlow's estate in West Norwood of London and developed this weapon. Hiram even published announcements in the local paper warning his neighbors that he would be experimenting with a gun. Open your windows, he suggested, to avoid the dangers of broken glass. That year, Hiram founded an arms company with funding from Edward Vickers. Under this arrangement, Hiram produced his machine gun in Kent. Later, Hiram's company merged with the Barrow Shipbuilding Company to become, in 1897, Vickers, Son, and Maxim. William Cantelow's sons read all about this in the papers. Hiram's machine gun was so similar to the one their father invented that they challenged Hiram on the patent. They were convinced that their father had assumed this new identity of Hiram Maxim, something which could not be proven, given Hiram's history. The Cantelow sons lost their suit against Maxim, and he continued in partnership to produce the, quote, Vickers machine gun. Hiram sold this weapon to the British government. And in fact, variants of the Maxim gun were sold to both sides during World War I. Hiram's resemblance to William Cantelow did not escape some in Southampton. There was a Mr. Dewey who went to the city of Kelmsford in Essex to visit an artillery exhibit. Mr. Dewey was stunned to see a gentleman there with a long white beard. It was the missing Mr. Cantelow. He called out. The man visibly reacted to the name, but chose to ignore Mr. Dewey. He later learned that the gentleman with the white beard was Sir Hiram Maxim. 
and then later in London, a man greeted Hiram as Mr. Cantalo. Hiram angrily replied, If you call me again by that name, I will give you in charge. Which is an English phrase meaning, I'll call the police. Clearly, Hiram had had enough, but these confusions would continue for the rest of Hiram Maxim's life. There are a few more details to this story that make a conclusion here quite difficult. There's one last point in favor of William having assumed a new identity. He did not want, contrary to the custom of the times, to have clergy preside over his funeral. It wasn't a thing many people did back then. And when Hiram Maxim died, his family carried out his wishes. His services did not include any clergy. Relatively recently, BBC Radio 4 covered the Maxim gun story and uncovered the fact that Hiram frequently complained about a man in America who was trying to impersonate him. Remember, William Cantalo was traced back to the United States and then vanished. Then, Hiram reportedly showed a picture of Cantalo standing with his machine gun to the Royal Armories. They concluded that the so-called Cantalo capstan of Williams and Hiram's Maxim gun were mechanically identical. And finally, this BBC4 program hired a facial expert to examine pictures of both men. The expert concluded that there were notable differences between their faces. There are so many similarities between the two inventors that it is more reasonable to assume they're the same man. And yet, the facts just don't align. How could William Cantlow be born in 1830 on the Isle of Wight and 1840 in Maine? How could he have led two lives, with witnesses, an ocean apart? It is something extraordinary that two people could look so similar, but to pursue the same career, invent the exact same machine, and cross like two ships in the night to dock on each other's homelands, it's statistically very unlikely. Could William and Hiram have been twins, separated at birth? Or could it be something a little more supernatural, like a doppelganger? The word doppelganger comes from German, literally meaning double walker. The concept is sometimes referred to as an evil twin. Or, and here's a lesser known psychic ability, by location. Could William Cantlow have projected his own double through the astral plane and lived two lives simultaneously? There are accounts of bilocation all throughout history, even in ancient Greece. There was that famous mathematician, Pythagoras. Remember high school and the Pythagorean theorem? A squared plus B squared? Yeah, that guy. Anyway, according to the philosopher and historian Porphyry, Pythagoras could bilocate. This historian writes, quote, Almost unanimous is the report that on one and the same day he was present at Metapontum in Italy and Torominium in Sicily, in each place conversing with his friends, though the places are separated by many miles, both at sea and land, demanding many days' journey. End quote. Witches in the 17th century were frequently accused of bilocation. And one infamous 20th century occultist, Aleister Crowley, claimed he too could bilocate, but he was never conscious of it happening. This is similar to the story of Mademoiselle Emilie Sagier, a French teacher in 1845. Through the windows of a classroom, 42 students observed Emilie Sagier out in the garden cutting flowers. Then, in an empty chair at the head of the classroom, the students witnessed the appearance of another Emily Sagi. They glanced out the window and saw that the first Emily was still in the garden, and the students and teachers of this school witnessed many more doubles of Emily over time. What's interesting is that she too claims that she is unconscious when this doubling occurs. Could William have unconsciously doubled himself so corporeally that his double could act independently, have a separate family. And if that's true, if it all emanates from William, of course his double would pursue the same dreams and invent the same machine. Perhaps both answers are correct. 
William Cantlow, and Hiram Maxim are both one and the same. This story is part of the Crimes of the Occult miniseries and is a production of Crawl Space Media. Produced, written, edited, and narrated by Jennifer Amell. Please see the show notes for music credits. And if you like this miniseries, let us know by rating and reviewing on Apple Podcasts. <laughs>